There's some lightness, but gay.com was a dark place. Hello, I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. This week, we are doing something a little bit different and visiting a lost website. Launching in 1997, long before the likes of Grindr and Scruff, Gay.com was a chat, personals, and social networking website catering mostly to gay men, which operated up until 2017. I caught up with Chicago-based drag queen, co-host and creator of hit YouTube show IMHO, Darby Lynn Cartwright, to discuss what the site meant to her as a queer kid growing up in Tennessee in the late 90s. And I do need to give a trigger warning before you listen to the episode that we do discuss some heavy topics, including statutory rape. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, to a very, like, Southern Baptist religious family. My twin brother is actually a pastor, so we took very different roads. And when I was in, I was either in eighth grade or ninth grade, and there was uh, this very uh, lesbianic girl, and she was super duper nice, and she came over and was like, hey, I found this website that I think you might like because we're talking about, we were talking about AIM and I was like, yeah, I, I talked to people on AIM and she's like, I have a website that I think you might like. And she oh, handed wait, wait. it to so me. So let, let's backtrack. AIM. Yeah. AIM was like ICQ AOL or instant, instant messenger. messenger. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. AOL instant messenger. That was a whole other phase, <laughs> but yeah, she handed me the slip of paper and she was like, don't open it. Like open this at home. And I was Aww. like, Okay. So I did open it at home and I'm glad she said that because had I opened it, I would have thrown it away and some big huff of like, what are you talking about? Um, so you opened, opened it, it and like uh, glitter popped out and streamers. And- yeah, there was glitter, uh, <laughs> used condoms. <laughs> and yeah, so gay.com was on the little tiny sheet of paper. So I said, sure, why not? And um, because, you know, there was, there was budding sexuality happening. So I knew, you know, I knew I was going to choose the wrong side. So I, yeah, I signed on and then I spent the next 10 years in a love hate relationship with gay.com. Truly. So is this the time of dial up internet? Oh yeah. And did you Mm -hmm. have one, one computer in the house? Yeah, we had. Do you remember the IMAX that were colorful? <gasps> but yeah, yeah. This little white with they had the back was like green or purple oh. or whatever. We had the we had the lime green one, fancy. and it sat. And it, yeah, very fancy. Grew up very middle class, and it sat in our front um, living room, which was not our the room where we would spend time. But they, it faced so that if you came down the stairs, you could see it, or if you were sitting in the den where we would hang out you could see it so it was very like out in the open so i got very good at closing tabs and erasing history (laughs) so then how did you pluck up the courage to first visit the site well i think like all teenagers who are trying to figure out their bodies in some way and they get to the internet it's like well back then now i know kids have access to the internet at birth but we all can't wait to explore. I think, um, like I remember the first thing I ever saw that was like adult content from the internet was this friend of mine in seventh grade. I was at his house and he's like, let me show you something. And he pulls up this 
picture and it was very large and it was dial up. So it was like, doom, <laughs> doom, doom. and I see some hair, I see a nipple and he printed me out a picture of like a naked lady. Hmm. Um, That's what friends are I, for. Yeah. I, well, we're not friends anymore. Um, he, uh, he died. Of laughter when I told the story. <laughs> no, he's fine. I just don't know where he is. He's dead to you, and that's all that matters. He's dead, exactly, exactly like Gator.com. And so I knew there were that kind of things on the internet. And then to be introduced to Gator.com, um, she's told me the the girl who gave me the sheet of paper. She said, "I think you could make some friends on here." <laughs> So in a, in a right. motherly patronizing way. <laughs> yeah. I, I, she, I think she was doing her best because it was, this was 1998, 1999 and, you know, very Christian conservative part of the world. So I think she was just trying to be like, Hey, you have like, you have a friend, like you're, I know, you know, I know, which I don't know how she could tell. I mean, I was just an eighth grade boy walking around singing Judy Garland in the hallways. <laughs> I was very, Were they, were they printed stunned. out naked woman picture in your bag? Well, I did carry it everywhere <laughs> I went. Um, she was my muse. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. So when I got on gay.com, I, I, I signed up under some, because I was a kid, you know, and you had to say you were 18 and I was all of 14. So I was like, hell yeah, I'm 18. I love to vote. <laughs> And I, I, I think my first screen name was something really innocent. And, you know, it was like here to make friends, 84 or whatever. <laughs> and it was not long that I realized that, oh, this is not like a friend making place. This is like a sex thing for the most part. I mean, there were certainly people who put in their bios like friends only, which you know what that means. That's like, I just want to talk to you and find out if you're a bottom first. But I mean, I, I can't explain it to the youth of today, but when the internet was still kind of coming to light, you really only knew the people in your immediate area. Like you really only knew the people in your town. So getting on that website, it was the first time I talked to a gay person. It was the first time that I identified as a gay person and talk to another gay person. And like, sure, was it about, you know, your butthole? For, for sure, there was some, some of that conversation. But it was just so exciting to know that there were other people in the world um, that I could access. Because mm. if I wanted to access a gay person, I'd have to go to conversion therapy. And I'm not doing that. No, ma'am. Um, so, so logging on to gay.com in like those mm-hmm. days, what, how, like, what was the chat function like? What, how did it work? Was it by so, area or? Yeah. So it had, um, first of all, the, the color combo was a, like a dark green and a dark black and a gray. So it was like cool. And um, yeah, there was general rooms that were like male for male, older for younger, male for male, bears, you know, whatever. And then there were, uh, the United States was broken down by areas. So it was like Northwest, South, you know, whatever. And then you could select your state. And that was usually the place to go for Memphis because you could select Memphis and go into a Memphis only chat room, but it was so small that Tennessee was usually like the place to go. But then, you know, in California, LA, you would want to go to the LA one or San Francisco. You'd want to go to the San Francisco one. Um, And then if you were truly just like looking to be naughty and like you didn't care that you would ever meet these people, that's when you ended up in the, um, I was always in the older, younger for obvious reasons. I was, I was playing that twink, twink role. I used it while I had it. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I do want to talk about that, but let's just like, let's talk about the, um, Tennessee room, first of all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, like this is something that the youth of today are not going to (laughs) understand. But you log in and then you go into the room and then there's just like a list of names that are profile names. 
Yes. Yeah. And can you then, do they have a profile that you can then go and look at? Yes. Yeah. It was, um, and it was the typical, like any gay dating website profile that you can imagine. It was, you know, headless torsos were very popular. Um, Oh, but there were photos. Yeah. Ah. Mm -hmm. Small photos. That was at the time people could say, sorry, I don't have a webcam. Sorry, (laughs) I don't have a picture on the internet. Because that was true. Like a lot of people, when I started to realize that the people with pictures got chatted with more often, I needed a picture. But I was too afraid to use my face. Um, So I... (laughs) My my dad's office was in our house and he had a scanner, you know, those like really slow, like <laughs> yeah. and it would take like 30 minutes to upload a four by six picture. I found a picture of me at the beach and my little oh, I was, thought you were going to tell me you sat on the scanner and just scanned in well, a picture of your that butt. Was, that, was <laughs> for that was for me. And I, I cut the picture because I didn't know how to crop. I didn't know if I'd be able to. I cut like my head out of the picture. <laughs> and me like holding a bucket in front of the ocean in a bathing suit. Um, yeah. And then boom, I was getting all of these messages out of nowhere. And then... but, yeah, they had profiles and they had, um, most people stayed in the general chat, but if it got, there was a limit to the amount of people who could be in it. Um, so if that ha- like, let's say Tennessee filled up, it would automatically launch a Tennessee two, And then the uh, people, I think only a hundred people could be in the first one. So it would, you know, it would just keep going down, but you wanted to be in the first room. Like that's where you wanted to be. And so it was just a constant click out. Refresh, refresh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. You wanted to be number one, but a lot of people would chat in the, the actual room and then you did have the option to click on the name view the profile and and you could go ahead and message someone privately and so what kind of chat was in the main room was it mostly like i live here who wants to suck my dick um well that i mean that's a beautiful sentiment but um yeah there was some of that there was you know Were you ever on the AOL, like, chat rooms? Did you ever? Okay. Well, for the kiddos who who did that, who are now grown adults with jobs they hate, it it was kind of like that. It was like the AOL chat room where people, especially in the sexual ones, would be like, these are my stats. This is what I'm ASL. Yeah. ASL. (laughs) ASL. Yeah. American Sign Language. Very (laughs) important. Um, Well, they didn't need sex because it was, like, all dudes, but... Yeah, and then there were some people who viewed themselves as keepers of the room, and they would actually start conversations about gay stuff. They'd be like, hey, Barbara Streisand's still alive. That's fun, right? You know, and they were like that back and forth. But there'd be a really fun conversation about some gay thing and pop culture happening. And then in the middle of it, you just have to take a break for all of the oh my God, my dick is so hard. And then you'd be like, great. <laughs> anyway, back to Barbara Streisand. <laughs> but so the person wasn't saying that they were hard as a result of the conversation about Barbara Streisand. <gasps> you know what? That's a light bulb moment. It could have been. You're absolutely right. I didn't know a lot about kink back then. I, I didn't know about the Streisand kink that is so prominent right. in our community. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, and so thinking about that list of names that appeared on the side of the the, uh, the window, is there anyone that you remember? <laughs> anyone that stuck with me from 1999? It was an important time. Like, you're, you know, your burgeoning sexuality being explored. Yeah. With Hung Dude, uh, 73. 73 would have been a good age for me. Uh, yeah, th- like... There was one that I was absolutely obsessed with because he catfished the entire room and he used these model pictures. And like, again, we didn't know a lot about the internet. So like researching, is that a real picture? Just, you just had to go with it. And and you thought that watermark was his tattoo, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, that's a weird tattoo. I didn't know that you were, uh, what's a shutter, shutter stop? Shutter, shutter. Yeah. Um, and he had it in different places on his body, depending on the picture. No, there's this guy, he used his initials like JVP or something, and it had like 3,000. And then he would get found out or something. I didn't know this, and he would change it to a different thousand. So it'd be like JVP 4,000, JVP 5,000. <laughs> no one will recognize me with this new name. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. I I don't remember a lot of their screen names. I remember when I identified what a twink was and I identified that I belonged in that category. Um, my screen names would change. They were very twink driven. And it was, I was just trying to be like playful. Um, so, okay, so, just, so talk to me about twink culture. So for anyone who's listening that doesn't know what a twink is, c- can you explain? Well, if you don't know what a twink is, um, then I, I can't help you. That's, that's a weird thing not to know. I mean, straight people know it now. Like it's a joke on late night TV. Um, yeah, and I'm speaking as a as a twonk. I'm certainly not a, a twink. Either. A twonk? But what is that? A past tense? It's past tense twink. It's ah, a twonk, and that's mm-hmm. a thing. I don't know. Uh, I think it's funny though. Okay, it's a thing so, I identify. Okay, so you're going to make that happen, right? Yeah. No, it's already happening. Okay. Cool. Brilliant. Um, no, a twink is like a young, hairless usually very skinny, uh, idiot child. Mm. Uh, Hairless is the key thing there, isn't it? Yeah. It's a big part of it. Cause if you have hair and you're skinny, you're an otter. You're not a twink. You've got to be hairless, which at 15 years old was not hard for me to do. You know, <laughs> God did that for me. I think maybe I was hairy at 15. It's unfortunate. Yeah, I could never have been Love the twin. skin you're in. No, body positivity. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. There was not body positivity in 1999. Was, <laughs> it was wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, uh, wax every inch of your skin or perish, basically. Um, yeah. So, so t- Twinkie usernames, mm-hmm. what, what would they be like? Oh, God. Um, I remember a specific... <laughs> Oh God! I remember a specific like person kept messaging me, um, and was really focused on the twink thing. And at the time, my screen name did not reflect that. And so I realized, like, oh, I got to jump on this opportunity. So I changed my screen name to something like Twink for Fun, you know, um, With a, Twink the for number, Christ, the whatever. number four or. Yes, of course. Okay, Don't be good, ridiculous. Good, 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 good. Well, it was gotta 1999. Sure. Just got to be sure. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of underscores for no reason. <laughs> and uh, then, so, then I went into a chat room and my screen name, whatever it was, immediately people started in the chat like making fun of it. <laughs> Damn it. And it took a few tries. I think I ended on um, Twink Me because I thought it sounded like Twinkie. <laughs> This is coming from like a very closeted teenager stuck in the Bible Belt. Okay, what is, but what does that even mean? Like, you know, it means hit me. Like, I need a twink. Twink me. Twink me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it it sounds like Twinkie, and it's it's a desperate attempt for attention. But isn't so. it isn't it more like someone who's not a twink who like wants a twink would be like twink me. Anyway, I'm overthinking this. Sorry. Yeah, you're overthinking this, and and that that person is dead. Uh, that that person no longer is with us. So we'd have to take a time machine and ask ask me because I don't I don't have an explanation. So anyway, so so you were doing lots of work in finessing and refining your username, and you came up with the gem that is Twink Me, and Twink. and so what kind of um, conversations started when you uh, stumbled upon this gem of a name? Um, you know, there was a lot of 
there were actually a lot of people who were there because they were in the same situation I was in. They were stuck in this really, you know, conservative, scary place and they just needed to connect. And I wouldn't say I made friends um, because once the sexual thing became more uh, something I was kind of gunning for that I had lost all interest in that. But once, when I got on the first time, like, you know, the conversations were like, tell me about your family. Are you out? The answer was always no. And a lot of us just talked about our future plans. It was like, well, what are you going to do when you can leave? And that was like a really, oh, so depressing. But that was like a lot of the conversation was just like, what's your current situation and how can you change it? I remember having a lot of conversations like that. A lot. Wow. So then, so I know nothing about Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You've said already that it's very conservative. Yes. What was it like growing up there? Super fun. No trauma. Uh, I would do it again 10 times. No, I'm just kidding. It was awful. Uh, it It was very, very conservative. It's the South. There are more churches um, than there are any other buildings. There's a church on every corner. Um, we grew up in a mega church, you know, those churches with like 10,000 members and you're screaming in an arena for Jesus. So that was just a huge part of our identity. Um, yeah, it was tough. It, it's, it's bizarre because I like Chan, the, the drag queen I do, uh, IMHO, my online series with, she's 10 years younger than me. And she also grew up in the South, but our experiences couldn't be any more different. It's, it's wild how quickly things changed. But mm. in the late 90s, early aughts, um, it was just survive as long as you can. Like, try and remain under the radar as long as you can. Because there are places they will put you. Like, I knew, I knew about the Exodus Ministries, the, the gay conversion therapy. Oh, wow. And that was my biggest fear, is that I would be found out and I would be sent to that. And it wasn't that I didn't want to be straight. I certainly did. I ended up going to a Southern Baptist college in Mississippi. I chose that because I thought it would help me change. To do musical theater? or (laughs) (laughs) It was vocal performance at first. And I was in a show choir called the Mississippi (laughs) College Naturals. And we always made the natural sign with our hands. Um, You know, super gay. I I had sex with a lot of, of men at that college. But yeah, I, I okay. Was, but so yeah. so, when did you like? You know, not that everyone has this kind of eureka moment, but when did you have that first inkling then that like, oh hey yeah maybe maybe I do like guys. Oh, super duper early. Like I remember, I have a distinct memory of a first. I was in the first grade classroom, and the girls were kind of giggling about how cute this boy was. And I was like, yeah, I think this, like, is this the thing people are thinking? Like, I definitely think this is the thing. And it just kind of, like, I remember when, you know, same around the same time when I was learning how to swim, there was a male instructor and a female instructor. And I was enamored with this young, muscular man. Um, I, I denied it at all costs. You know, I did a lot of prayer. Um, But it wasn't until I realized that, oh, this isn't just like something wrong with me. This is something that a lot of people are. And like truly signing on to gay.com, and I'm sure it's similar to other sites like Gaydar and whatever, and realizing that like, oh, this isn't some quote unquote problem that you have. It's it's something that a lot of people just live as. Um, it definitely helped me change my perspective. I mean, did I go back and forth with the, you know, Southern Baptist guilt? Absolutely. Like I cannot tell you how many times I deleted gay.com. Like I have, I have deleted it and signed up again so many times. It was like twink me one, twink me two, twink me three, twink me four. Um, but you know, when I was in a good headspace, it was a it was a great comfort for sure. So you've talked about being afraid of being sent to to an, 
ex-gay ministry type situation to be yeah. converted. Was, there, was that like an actual or a real threat in your family? I knew of somebody um, when I was in middle school uh, who was sent to one uh, from my church group. And Exodus Ministries is what it was called. And they would do these large, like our pastor would give a, a sermon on homosexuality and how dangerous and disgusting it is. And then when you came out of the service, they'd have this big setup and you could go get like a pencil and a keychain that says Exodus Ministries and they'd give you, you know, all of this literature. You could purchase books. Um, when my mom found out that I was gay when I was 19, she the first thing she did was go to an Exodus Ministries conference um, and she purchased this book called You Don't Have to Be Gay. And it, <laughs> the, I still have it. It's very funny to me. It says, you don't have to be gay. And on the front, it's just a man peeking uh, behind some blinds, peeking into a house. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it makes me giggle. Um, but yeah, Exodus Ministries and the dangers of homosexuality, were they were very vocal about that. Um, so I internalized that and I, I knew I couldn't leave. My, I, could, I knew I couldn't leave home and survive it. Like I just, I didn't think I could do that. Mm. And, but then, so like accessing gay.com in the house when yeah. your parents were around. Well, my parents uh, both had jobs that kept them like my dad had a home office, but for the most part he worked at his office and he would do home office stuff on the weekends. So my parents were rarely at home when we were, um, in, especially in high school. And my brother and my sister and I would set times, you know, like, <laughs> I want the computer from this time to this time. And we all kind of knew that we were probably doing things that we shouldn't be doing. So we just left it alone. So if, like, if it was my brother's time on the computer on that gorgeous green iMac. Um, we just, I just wouldn't look at it while he was on it. And the same thing for us. My brother has since, now that we're grown, my brother did say that he saw me looking at gay porn uh, <laughs> like when we were in high school. And he's like, I didn't say anything, but like, yeah, of course I knew. I mean, he must have been like, looking well, for like it. half we're an just... hour if he could see the whole image load. <laughs> Oh, and a video, forget it. It's just not going to happen. <sighs> yeah. But, but like browser history, did, mm -hmm. no one, did no one ever find out? Um, we knew how to delete the browser history. However, my brother, so <laughs> my brother calls me into the living room. He's on the computer and he goes, look what I found. And it's a folder labeled cache. But we thought it was cache since it's C A C H E. Yes, of course. And it's all the little images that you've seen are saved to this folder. And so my brother goes, <laughs> Hey, I was on this website and suddenly a porn ad popped up. And look, there's all these pictures of naked women in this folder. Like, what do we, how, what is this? How do we get rid of this? And I was like, That is such a problem. And I knew, I was like, That is, that is quite a conundrum. So we called my dad's tech guy at his company and he walked us through how to delete it. And of course he was like giggling the whole time. And he was like, first of all, it's cash. Um, and this is how you get rid of it. I mean, he was young. He was like, I, I get it, you know? Um, but yeah, we were very careful with the browser history and the cash once we figured out what it was. I love that that was your solution, though. Let's ring someone who's connected to our dad. <laughs> I thought that, well, I thought that my brother's excuse was solid. Like, an ad popped up, <laughs> now there's titties. Like, it, it rang true to me. Uh, I mean, it rang true to Twink Me Too. Like, I, it, in that mindset, it was very simple for me to, to sign on to something. <laughs> and the passwords, that was another thing. Anytime you'd sign in, it would save the passwords. So you'd have to go in and delete your gay.com password. I did that a lot. Um, and so let's talk about the older, younger uh, chat room. Yeah. Yeah. Trigger warning. If, uh, you know, this is definitely, 
it's not great. Um, but yeah, I, of course the older men, um, were the ones that mostly pursued me. Um, I would say I was 18. It was clear I was not. Um, so I say older men, but the ones who really engaged me, uh, I think older men is too nice of a term. It was more, that was pedophilia, you know? And it started off truly like, I, I just thought that I was being accepted in this new identity and that daddies, older men were the people that would accept me. So I needed to continue that, you know, realm. And that's kind of how my sexuality, uh, blossomed was under that. So, you know, even today, even at 36, like I still am very much attracted to older men. Like it just, that's what I came to understand sex to represent. Um, you said, um, you thought that the older men would accept you. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? They were so excited to talk to me. It was the most acceptance. It was the most, I felt like I belonged that I could find, you know, in, in the life I was living. No one would accept me. No one would be excited to talk to a gay guy in Memphis but that I knew, but these other men, they wanted to talk to me. Like they thought I was fine. They actually think I'm better than fine. Um, I think it was just like a coping thing, really. But you didn't find that from people your own age or people slightly older. I think it was the pursuit the, the, the pursuit of that the older group showed me was so flattering to my dumb little brain um, that I was just, I was just drawn to it. The fact that people were drawn to me because, you know, I was the skinny effeminate kid who just always got made fun of growing mm-hmm. up for how I talked and how now I'm here. And all of those qualities are like, you know, exciting and, um, and to be lauded really. Um, so it just kind of, you know, started there. And my first sexual experience was I was 14 or 15, a guy I met on gay.com and much older man. Um, yeah, he came over to my house while my parents were, while my entire family was at church. And, um, yeah, it oh, was, it, wow. yeah, it, well, and it, you're very vulnerable at that age. You're very vulnerable when you've internalized all this homophobia. Um, when I came out to my dad, my dad said, and, and my dad said this a lot growing up. I just, whenever homosexuality would be brought up at church or whatever, it's just that gay people die. Gay people die young. Mm-hmm. Don't long. So I, as soon as I got that physical touch from someone else, even though it wasn't something I, I enjoyed, um, I had never had an orgasm. Like I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what he was doing. Um, I just, so you'd never like, you'd never wanked. No. Oh, wow. We used to, my brother and I used to smash our stuff against like chairs and toy boxes our toy box was like solid wood. So we would just kind of hump the toy box. Um, my mom called it hurting ourselves and she'd be like, don't you hurt yourself. Don't you like, we have a video of us like cleaning, like we were giving our car, our play car, like a wash down or whatever. And then my brother just stops and gets on top of the car and starts like humping it. Cause he, he needed a break. But and you can hear my mom go, don't hurt yourself. But like, like, like at Dogwood. I got sent home in kindergarten for doing that. I humped my chair and I got sent home. But yeah. You, uh, it's, uh, Kids do that, right? Do they? <laughs> I don't know. It was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you'd like have an erection. Mm-hmm. And you would like 
rub against something. No, 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 no. It was more like the the idea would pop in our head and then I would just plop down on the ground and just start humping it. And I think I would, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm I think, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm not judging you. No, that's fine. If you want to judge like a seven-year-old, <laughs> go for it. I mean, you're the app in the situation. But like, so... Uh... You, uh, so would you and your brother do it at the same time? Um, yeah, sometimes it was just, we didn't know what it was. Like we didn't know what sex was. We didn't know what it was. And my mom and dad never took time to explain it. It was literally just hurting yourself, hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. You're hurting yourself. But they never explained what that meant. That's a Southern parent though. Okay. I feel. Yeah. Okay. So, like, arranging for this man to come over, do, like, do mm-hmm. you remember what you were anticipating? No, I, I remember that he kept calling me beautiful in the chat. Like, I remember he kept calling me beautiful and kept saying he had to meet me. And I was so flattered by that and so excited that someone was calling me beautiful um, I don't, I, I didn't have any sort, I didn't even have, all I knew about sex really was from these chats, what people had told me, but I, I didn't know what it was, you know, like, and we didn't have videos. There wasn't like the computer didn't have porn videos back then. So I, you know, um, I, I yeah, but it happened and I, I immediately associated being gay with that, like with sex, like yeah. it's not a friendship thing. It's, it's truly sex and that's how you get acceptance. That's the only way people will really treat you well. And, uh, and then you die young, you know? So I was like, well, I've already started the journey and gay.com was, it was a hookup place you know mm-hmm. and then once once that had kind of turned on for me all of the the fun of like meeting new friends and chatting publicly it was gone i had flipped a switch and i was like all right this is what i'm going to use it for um and then so your the the switch was flipped and so how did that manifest just the I think the desire to be desired like that, it it became overwhelming. Like it was, I couldn't wait to get home from school so I could get on. Like I couldn't wait. If my brother was on the computer, I would make up an excuse to like get on early, you know? Um, I honestly don't remember a lot of the sexual encounters that I had uh, that early. And I think that's a probably like a defense thing. Um, but I do remember the mindset. Like I do remember thinking there is a certain group out there that want you. There's a certain group that think that you are perfect. And I, I didn't know how to categorize that. Like I didn't, I didn't know what pedophilia was. I didn't know that this was wrong. And I, I, so I just kept going. Um, when I was 15, 14 or 15, I got gonorrhea and I went to my pediatrician, the 92 year old man who had helped deliver me like truly bizarre, you know, sitting in this, sitting on top of an elephant, you know, <laughs> and then, and getting a, a sucker at the end. And he he said, well, I'm going to have to tell your parents, but you have gonorrhea. And I was like, what's that? It's like the sexually transmitted disease. And so my parents, um, my parents' response was, what girl have you been with? And so I named a random girl and, um, they never asked any questions after that. Really? So continued. No, nothing. That is a conservative Christian approach though. I mean, that's, it should surprise people who grew up in a household like that. So do you think that was kind of more along the lines of them being relieved that it was a girl? 
Yeah. And then oh, just being yeah. like, okay, so, okay, we'll move on now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <sighs> there. And then, yeah. so, so if all of this was happening at that young age and you were still in high school, how did it change your relationships with people your own age? Um, I was, I was very involved in high school and musical theater and choir and all of that. Um, very straight, mask for mask. And and you and, came out when you were nineteen. Sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was the, you know, I was the hot straight guy in the group. So. Um, totes, man, totes. Yeah. So I didn't, I I melded, I got along really well with that group. So I had my close like choir friends and all of that. Outside of that, I didn't really have anyone else. So I didn't have enough relationships for it to really affect and the choir relationships were so based in this environment that was just kind of all consuming. Uh, you know, show choir kids are the worst. And I don't think it really affected me in that way. It did affect me when I got to college because suddenly now my entire life is my, my time, my free time. I get to decide, you know, what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it. Um, then it got to be a little excessive. Well, then, so if we just stay in high school for a moment, so you were able to kind of compartmentalize these two bits of your life. Yeah, I mean, I could compartmentalize it to the point that as soon as whatever we were doing was over uh, and they left the house, it didn't happen. Like, it was just, it never happened. Like, I was just watching TV. I didn't feel, like, guilt with my parents. Like, they'd come home. Because in my mind, it just never happened. And so it wasn't this kind of like exciting thing that was just like something that you were kind of dying to tell people, but you couldn't. No, no, oh, not at that's all. So interesting. And 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 so they always came to your house. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was fifteen. I didn't know. Like, I I don't know how I would get to them. When I started driving, like when I turned sixteen, seventeen. Um, yeah, like I would, I would drive sometimes, but my parents, so my parents, my entire family went to this mega church and my twin brother was very active in it, very well liked, which made me feel like shit. And so my choir director, who I was obsessed with because I was a choir kid, he was a music minister at a different church. So I actually went to a different church when I was in high school. So my family would be, they'd, they'd be at that church all the time. And I would just say that I was going to my church and I would end up just staying home. Uh, yeah. Because um, cause the other thing is that like, there's quite a lot to arrange there, isn't there? It's not like nowadays where you can just be like, oh, you're 300 meters away. How about you come in? Yeah. And the, you know, we didn't have cell phones. Like it, it, it was truly like, if my parents like came up the driveway and somebody was pulling up to the front door, like I had no way to contact them to be like, go away, go no. away. Yeah. So, yeah. So I built a system for it. And I said, of course, if there's a car in the driveway, don't come in. If there's a car in the garage, I'll turn on a light in this window. And that was like my, my trick. Aren't humans adaptable? Yeah. We're sly, sly creatures. That ingenuity. Um, okay, yeah. so back to university, college. Mm -hmm. I, they're the same thing, right? Yeah. It's not like... Yeah. I, okay. I, I don't know what the difference is, but no, yeah, they're the same. I think in the UK, college is different. I should know that, though. I know that I, I have more loan debt from my Mississippi college days than I do my University of Western Kentucky or Western Kentucky University, wherever I went. <laughs> it's not really important though, right? Um, not, yeah, no, the, <laughs> the, um, so, so you were suddenly independent. You suddenly had free reign. Yeah. And uh, I was just always logged in. I was, I was never not on gay.com and I would miss class. I would, 
there was one point that I went late at night to hook up with someone and my brother came to, to talk to me in my dorm room and I wasn't there. My roommate didn't know where I was. My brother called his friends and his like men's club. Cause you can't have fraternities at a Christian college, his men's club. Um, but, uh, why can't you have me. fraternities? Sorry, this is not really important. Because uh, drinking, drinking and like Greek gods and all that shit. We were like a no drinking, only Jesus college. Oh, okay. So, I mean, yeah. men's club sounds kind of fun. Oh, yeah, no, no. I joined one and I had sex with many of the men <laughs> in that club. Um, it was a very gay college. Like Mississippi College was known as Mississippi Closet to every gay person. Um, but yeah, I, he sent out like a search party for me and I really had to like, I don't remember what my excuse was, but I, I just wasn't worried about it because I knew I wasn't going to give this up. I wasn't going to stop. So I made up some flimsy excuse and he chose to believe it and, um, moved it on. And so you were, were you at college together? Yeah. Cause he was studying to become a minister and I was studying to become a drag queen, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we were in college together and we lived together for a little bit, uh, my sophomore year. And then I ended up transferring schools my junior year. I just had to get away from Southern Baptist, but yeah, we, we were really close and he got to be very protective of me. Um, like he, he knew I was gay. Like he knew that I was going to have a tough time. So he was very, very protective of me. Um, but he, he let me have my space. So I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> One of the two. Uh, and we say, so were you comfortable with that dynamic? Yeah. Like, again, I, I was very good at turning the brain off. Like I was very, very good at, it didn't happen. Nothing happened. Um, I just kind of been trained to, to live that way. So I, yeah, I was, I, I never brought any sort of guilt with me, um, concerning that. And then, you know, really freshman and sophomore year of college is when I really started to accept the fact that it is more than just sex on the side. It can be a relationship. Those things do exist that I started to realize, like, fuck this, fuck this, like, fuck Mississippi College, like, fuck their belief. Um, so there's almost like a defiance of like, I'm going to do more. Like, mm -hmm. you can't stop me. Mm -hmm. And, you know. And then, so what's like the gay scene like in Mississippi? Like, is there a scene or, or is like gay become <laughs> your only option? I don't know if there's a scene now. I'm sure there's something. For me, it was just gay.com because I didn't, I didn't want to be a part of like a gay culture. I didn't want to bring anything non-sexual as into my life, like any gay I had Judy Garland. Like, that was enough. I couldn't, there was no more room for gay in my life. But I'm sure there's got to be clubs now, right? So you just weren't curious? Mm-mm. Well, I didn't drink. Like, I, we, I was very, like, as much gay sex as I was having, I was still very, like, Southern Baptist. I didn't drink. I didn't, like, I didn't curse. I was just very, um, so the idea of going to a club just didn't interest me at all. Mm. at all but your thinking did start to to morph away from your identity being just about the sex and and that you could be I met friends my, with people yes yeah i met my first boyfriend uh on gay.com <gasps> what's his name he was nick oh. sweet, sweet with, nick. with a k there right mm -hmm, and i see k yeah good which is my dad's name so that was super sexy. Easy to remember. Uh, 
<laughs> easy to remember. He was actually the son of one of the professors at my college. And we dated <laughs> for, oh God, like six weeks, I think. Something <sighs> very strong. That's um, longer than any of my relationships. So. I mean, I, I still hold the record in Mississippi for the longest gay relationship. <laughs> um, I'm not giving up that title. But yeah, it's that is what really helped me see. Like he, he was the first time I lost like my virginity with my butt. And he was the first time that like someone wrote me a love note. He was the first time somebody bought me a present, you know, like a Valentine's present. Um, so once I realized like that could happen, it was over. I think I just, I wasn't going back. Oh, Nick, Nick is quite special then. So did it start, yeah. did it start off as a hookup and then progress or did it start off in a mm-hmm. more wholesome place? Yeah, it started off just kind of like hookup talk. And then he's like, I think I might actually like you. Um, yeah. And then we went to dinner, but we had to go like far away from college because we didn't want anyone to see us <sighs> dinner. Yeah. And that was your first so. date? Mm-hmm. Oh, where did you go? Yeah. We went to, we went outside of Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I think it was like a diner or something. It was like definitely like a Denny's or something. I don't, I don't totally remember. But I do remember we had to drive a really long way because we the school was in Clinton, Mississippi, which is where Lance Bass from NSYNC is from. And the closest big city is Jackson. And that was still too close. So we drove on the other side of Jackson um, to find something so that no one would see us. Like, did you go together or did you go separately? We went together. Okay. Uh, he had a red Jetta because he was gay. And... He he had an off-campus apartment, so I would walk over there and we would go. But I would definitely, <laughs> when I drove by to campus, I would scooch down. How fascinating. Fascinating, sad, you know, wh- whatever word you want to use. <laughs> but so you, had like, so you had six weeks of bliss and then bliss. it ended. But, mm-hmm. but things had like changed for you by then. At that point, the the sexual compulsion was like too ingrained. Like that was just a part of me. I continued to date. I ended up dating like a football player at our rival school, a Methodist college, um, for like a year. <gasps> you might and have to explain that to me. What? So what's the difference? Methodist and Southern Baptist. Yeah. Southern Baptist is like when you watch evangelicals like screaming to God for Trump to win the presidency, like turnover, that's like an evangelical. That's like a Southern Baptist. A Methodist is like, you can drink wine. It's fine. Uh, Some Methodist churches allow gay people in. They're just way more laid back. Okay. Southern Baptist is, they're terrorists. Like to the, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So I'm on the right page. Um, let's talk about compulsion. Yeah. A bit more. So did that compulsion just go away when you were dating people? No, no, no. It, it would go away for like three or four months. And then it was just like back in full force. And at that point, it wasn't just gay.com. Like there was Adam for Adam um, was that when Craigslist, Craigslist started? I don't know. There was other options. So you um, had like multiple browser windows open. Yeah. <laughs> well, plus my homework and my Bible. <laughs> I had to. I was in a Bible class, so I had to keep up with that. But this compulsion. So, how did that? Like, how did that impact those relationships? Were you? Was it again a matter of compartmentalizing? Yeah. Um, it wasn't positive. It wasn't a positive impact. Um, it, yeah, it, I was able to hide it really, really well early on. And a big reason I was able to hide it really well was again, like technology had not caught up 
you know, like you could delete your texts and there wasn't like a record there, you know, there was a lot of things that just didn't exist that exist now. Um, so it was super duper easy. And then as technology developed, I got worse and worse at hiding it until ultimately it was destroying my, my relationship. And I went into like a 12 step recovery program. Oh, okay. And that's how, yeah, there's a sexual compulsives and a sex, sex addict uh, program. And what do and you, that, and so is that like a, the same type of approach as like, it's any exactly other addiction? The same. yeah. Yeah. 12 steps, exact same 12 step. You get a sponsor, you do the steps. I've had a lot more success with my sex addiction or not my sex addiction, my sexual therapist, my sex therapist. Um, that helps me kind of take apart in my brain the, the things that I, I don't understand how they go together or I don't understand how the past trauma has like affected my current behavior. Um, so I had a lot more success with this, with the sex therapist, but the, the, the 12 step program did help start that desire to change for sure. Um, and so, and so like, what are your, again, like you don't have to talk about this. So like, what are your triggers? Um, I don't, I don't really have them anymore. Um, it's not, it's, I guess I've, I've, I've started to put my brain back together. Um, but a lot of it at the time, a lot of it was, uh, really just the online stuff. Like it, it got to the point that I wasn't like hooking up with people, but I couldn't stop looking for it. Um, that was a lot of, of, of what I, what I experienced. And so it's looking for that gratification. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it, it's, it's the thing that it was the first thing, first positive emotion I felt surrounding my sexuality was that validation I received from the chat rooms. And so I think it makes sense that as I continued to desire it, it just became a, like a hardwired thing I needed. Mm -hmm. I felt. Mm -hmm. Is this the most depressing lost faces you've ever done? Which is like the sad one. Everyone's um, like, I, I miss the bar. Like I love dancing at the bar. And I'm like, yeah. So anyway, I got molested. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's clicked off with this one. I, I want to say in general, because I was thinking, I was thinking about this after we decided that gay.com was the, the lost space we would discuss. I, I haven't thought about it in years. I haven't talked about it in years. And it was a huge part of, it was the only way I really learned to develop my sexuality. And it was a part of my life for 10 years. It became a pretty toxic part of my life. However, I did have some positive interactions. I did have, um, I did see that gay people lived in the world. I did speak to another gay person and I said, I'm like you, you know, like I, I just think back then those resources were so important and there were so few and far between. So I'm not surprised that it, it was, it took on a strong sexual thing because gay guys are the worst, but mm -hmm. um, I regret that I not regret. I, I wish I had had, a better uh, outline to take on that, that gay .com. like I wish I had had some sort of framework to put gay.com in instead of me just like discovering it. Um, but I, I'm happy I had something. Is that, is that a safe thing? I don't know. Am I happy? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, well, I, I guess it's know. like, it, what else, what else, what was the alternative? Like, what else could you have found? Yeah, I, and I don't know. I don't know what that would have been, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that Q 
kids today, these crazy kids, I'm really happy that they don't have to have the experience that I had for the most part. I'm not saying that there aren't still kids stuck in tough situations, but, um, yeah, gay.com is wild. Did you ever visit gay.com? Well, if you did, I would love to hear from you. Find me on social media and share your stories and anecdotes from using that website. I am on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the user handle K Anderson Music. And also make sure that you give Darby a follow on Instagram at Darby Lynn Cartwright and make sure that you follow IMHO The Show on YouTube. It's youtube.com IMHO The Show. Simple, right? Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there, and we'll be releasing songs over the next year. You can hear the first single, Well Broom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now on all streaming platforms. If you liked this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told other people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.